Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining the Seattle Science Foundation Young Surgeons Conference today. Today, we are going to be talking about maximizing your digital footprint as a surgeon, as well as developing your early career reputation offline with Antonio Webb and Peter Derman. So, so this evening's format will have those two 20 minute talks followed by a Q&A session. Please type your questions in the chat box during the lectures and they'll be answered during the Q&A. If you want to join the conversation at the end, please raise your hand um, during the Q&A. We'll move you over to the panelist side so you can turn on your camera and microphone towards the end. Also information for how to claim CME credit will appear on a slide towards the end of the conference as well as in the chat box, so keep your eye out for that. You have two hours after the conference to text in your attendance. All right, and we're gonna get started with Dr. Antonio Webb. He is an orthopedic spine surgeon in San Antonio, Texas. Take it away. All right, thank you, Sandy. Good evening, everyone. Um, I will get started. I have a lot of slides, so I'm gonna be flying pretty quickly. I have a timer set. Um, but some objectives, uh, encourage a presence or a kind of a more active presence on social media if you already have a social media presence. Uh, learn some ways to utilize social media to complement and possibly grow your practice as well as learn five reasons why every physician should use social media professionally. Um, I have no disclosures kind of that are re re relevant to this talk, but before we get started, uh, social media is not for everyone. Uh, it does require some time commitment, and some people may not be comfortable kind of uh, sharing things online, which is totally okay. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon here at pri in uh, private practice in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I'm in a pretty large uh, spine group with uh, 10 spine surgeons. Uh, we have about four to five uh, physiatrists, pain physicians, and uh, these are kind of my interests in spine surgery. Uh, but I first started off, I get this question a lot, just with a blog in medical school. I just wanted something that my family members could kind of follow throughout my progress, uh, throughout my training. And this became very popular and I decided to transform this into making videos uh, starting around 2015. And the first uh, videos were, com were commonly asked questions pertaining to the medical path, uh, just kind of the, those questions that medical students have about what tests to take and also kind of addressed a lack of kind of diversity kind of in medicine. And it kind of coincides that I have a passion for videography and cinematography. Um, so I started making videos about tips on studying for, for preparing for the MCAT and step exams, interviewed some deans of medical schools, um, as well as some day in the life videos. But these were not really practice oriented and, uh, you know, but it, it still is uh, pretty important in terms of, uh, you know, starting a practice and building a practice and having an online presence. Uh, this is just one of the series that I started, Careers in Medicine. I've interviewed probably about 85 uh, medical professionals and all different uh, specialists just to kind of share their story and talk about their specialty. And these are just some of the, uh, the video types that I have on my channel. But in, in, in all, um, I have over 300,000 followers, uh, most of them on YouTube, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of speak about that. Uh, with over 27 million uh, views uh, on YouTube thus far. But a few things that I have found helpful. Uh, number one is finding a, a niche, um, and whether this is a doctor vlog or educational channel, a business of medicine channel, you, you need to have some niche that you can kind of fill. Also providing value and content, and whether this is like educational videos for your patients or insights into the life as a surgeon. There are a lot of people that are very interested in like what goes on in kind of the day and the life of a surgeon, as well as being very consistent. Uh, and I uh, kind of over the first couple of years, I was uploading maybe two to three videos per week. Uh, but why is this important? Well, health related searches are common. They comprise 4.5% of the, the queries entered in search engines. And internet usage affected the choice of hospital choice and about 50% of patients, as well as their selection of physician and about 40% of patients. This is just a survey from 2011 that stated that 80% of internet users have looked online for information uh, about their particular condition or, or, or disease. Well, social media has the potential 
to serve as a means of communication, education, as well as marketing in all healthcare specialties. And there, there may be some physicians that are very reluctant to uh, you know, engage in social media pr um, presence due to privacy, litigation, as well as lack of experience. But there are some specialties that have really capitalized on this, uh, including plastic surgery. This is just a uh, study that came out in 2017 where they looked at the pediatric orthopedic surgeons. They looked at the, the positive me members and they found that 95% of these members had websites uh, about one third of them had YouTube pages, but in all, in conclusion of this study, they suggested that pediatric orthopedic surgeons may be underutilizing their potential uh, social media presence. This is another uh, study that we just submitted some abstracts, uh, kind of a collaboration with UCSF, Texas Back, and then uh, Dr. Burleson out in, um, Nash in Nashville, uh, where we perform web-based searches of 325 spine surgeons kind of using the North American uh, Spine Society database across 76 institutions. We looked at their online presence, their age, their practice type, uh, the number of years in practice, as well as their publication history. And we found that uh, about 65% of all spine surgeons that we looked at had at least one professional social media platform. Most of these surgeons did not have any social media activity in the last 90 days. Uh, and then surgeon age, years in practice, as well as practice type, they were strongly correlated with uh, social media activity. This is just a, a chart kind of depicting that about 65% of the spine surgeons that we looked at had some sort of uh, social media presence. Uh, and then in terms of their activity, most of the surgeons uh, didn't have any activity uh, within the last 90 days. And in conclusion, we found that um, spine surgeons kind of compare it to that uh, pediatric orthopedic surgery paper um, that they lack uh, kind of uniformly a social media presence online. This is just another quick paper looking at hand surgeons. Um, and they found that when they looked at um, 116 hand surgeons, about a quarter of those had personal websites, a quarter of them had YouTube pages, but in general, they suggested that hand surgeons, orthopedic hand surgeons, underutilized their social media platforms as well. And that they did show that uh, the physicians who had personal websites, they did receive higher health grade scores. So if this is something that you think is important, important for a practice building, well, a, uh, you know, definitely a personal website may help with that. And then a couple of the uh, social media pages. So Facebook, um, what, what I would suggest is to create a separate professional page. You can post health tips, uh, live videos of your, lay, your, your day as a doctor, links to articles. You can hold Q&A sessions with your followers. In terms of Twitter, this is uh, mostly good for kind of those health factoids, uh, posting links, facts, and opinions, uh, any relevant um, medical tweets, and then Instagram is kind of a more a, a casual kind of platform. You can uh, certainly post graphics with health tips, uh, images of your day as a physician, and then hold some live Q&A sessions with your followers as, as well. And then YouTube, and I'm going to really spend a couple minutes on this just because uh, the importance of YouTube and uh, what I think it can do for your practice. Uh, well, this is a platform that uh, can certainly um, you know, help your practice or supplement your practice when you're trying to build it. And then a question is like, why do you focus so much on YouTube? Well, this kind of goes back to Willie Sutton when they asked him, why do you rob banks? And he said, that's, that's where the money is. And you know, YouTube, I think certainly that's where majority of the patients that can come see you as a potential patient, um, you know, they are utilizing YouTube. Well, Google, it holds 92% of the, the, uh, the world's uh, search engine market share. Google actually owns YouTube. They, they bought it in uh, 2006 for, for $1.65 billion. And YouTube is actually the most popular website in the world. It has 2 billion monthly active users worldwide. And then you can navigate it in over 80 different languages. Um, so if you uh, type in back pain in Google, um, and I did this when I was out in Dallas for fellowship, um, this is one of the practices that, that comes up uh, right away the dispine.com. Uh, uh, they have a pretty you know, decent website. Uh, they have all their uh, physicians and providers kind of listed. Um, they make it really easy so that uh, patients can schedule at certain locations and their preferred day of week. 
and then the contact information so they can go ahead and schedule that appointment. But what they did was, uh, you know, this is an ad, this is an, a paid ad, but they did optimize their title tag, they optimized their meta description, um, minimally invasive options to relieve pain and help you live a, a better life. So all of these words here are really important words when patients are searching for these keywords. If you put in spine disc replacements, um, you'll see that they pop up again right away. But also Dr. Bert Noli, who's over in Europe. Uh, so if you're typing this in in Dallas, Texas, um, his website is one of the top ones that, com that comes up. And I, I thought that was pretty interesting that uh, he was so far away kind of in Europe, but he's still marketing to uh, patients that are in the U.S. And then lumbar disc replacement, um, you know, Scott Blumenthal had a video that uh, did really well. Well, this can bring a lot of traffic to your practice and also to your websites. So the question is, how do you rank high and generate traffic? Well, this goes all into, everyone's probably heard of this, uh, SEO. So this is increasing the quantity and quality of your traffic to your websites. Uh, but this all kind of uh, is about kind of understanding what people are searching for online understanding the answers people are seeking, as well as the words that they're using. And there's a lot of different things that go into SEO, but if you can imagine the more presence that you have online and whether this is uh, social networks, webinars, podcasts, interviews, uh, these things are very important and can generate a lot of traffic to you and also your website. Uh, these are just some um, examples like the AAMC. They have a really high Google rank. So if you're featured on this website, uh, this is an example of what's called a backlink. And the, the more backlinks that you have, the higher ranking that uh, Google will use to uh, rank you. As well as uh, Kevin MD he has a really high kind of Google kind of ranking just because of the amount of traffic that he generates. Uh, just some other examples of some other uh, pages that have millions of followers that can generate traffic to your to your website and to your practice. And then there's also ads that you can uh, pay for. We talked about um, the institution in Dallas that, you know, has those ads that are at the top of their page. Well, um, you, you can really get very specific with this in terms of uh, the demographics that you're trying to reach and target, uh, the age group, the area of the country as well as the keywords, which are probably one of the most important things because this is what patients are searching for. If they have uh, you know, shooting pain down their legs, some radicular symptoms, or if they have neck pain, um, you know, they're searching these keywords into Google and you have to be able to um, have a presence online that will be able to capture that keyword. Uh, but how powerful is this? Uh, well, very powerful. This is just a couple examples of some posts that I put online. Um, and within two weeks, uh, this post here, 700,000 views. Uh, this post here, 680,000 views. Uh, when I posted about my graduation graduation from fellowship, over 5 million views and within a week. And then just posting about my first day as a, a spine surgeon in practice, 1.4 million views. So this is certainly something that can generate a lot of traffic uh, to your practice and to your uh, website. And it's just not uh, kind of uh, for patients. This, this is just you know for medical students as well. You never know uh, who your message or the things that you're putting out online can actually touch. Uh, this is a email that I received from the Dean of my medical school at Georgetown. And she stated that two men that uh, were interviewing at Georgetown, they stated that their inspiration for wanting to go into medical school was from my video. So I thought that was uh, pretty cool. This is just a, a chart that depicts, uh, this is not only just in the US. Uh, a lot of my followers are from Canada, from the UK, Australia, Philippines, Germany, South Africa. And this is uh, something that kind of breaks it down also from where these followers, uh, followers are from. Um, messages from all over the world, Australia, Brazil, France, uh, Africa, Ghana, patients who are in uh, Spain, Finland, and uh, you know, will these generate actually uh, you know, patients that come in that need actually surgery or some type of treatment? Probably not, but you know, this can certainly generate a lot of traffic to your website that Google will use to, uh, to rank you. And the, just a uh, patient who contacted me, heard about me on LinkedIn and I was able to see him in clinic. But how far would these patients travel? Well, 
TBI has demonstrated this quite well over the years. The Centers for uh, Displacement that they have there, their travel program. I spoke with Dr. Geyer um, earlier today. He stated that two thirds of his practice comes from uh, patients who travel. And over the years, he thinks uh, over a thousand patients um, has you know, traveled to see him and possibly undergone surgery. Well, you can also get some corporate rate agreements. And this is one of the first things that I did when I got in practice. I contacted a few uh, local hotels for patients who travel and they will give them a discount if you sign a corporate rate agreement with them. So this is certainly something that you can do for your patients who are traveling. You can certainly give them discounts to the local hotels. Uh, this is a quick study retrospective chart review of patients who were looking for endoscopic uh, procedures. And they found that most of these, uh, the patients, they were traveling and uh, kind of the Dutch patients, 287 miles. For the US patients, about 91 miles on average that these patients were traveling to undergo this procedure. Well, th these are just some of the pictures. Uh, I've been in practice for about six months and um, you know, I, I've definitely noticed that there are a number of patients who have found me online or heard about me from either some social media platform, from uh, uh, YouTube, from Instagram, from LinkedIn. Uh, this patient traveled in from Kansas to see me. Uh, and then this uh, lady right here, she traveled from Louisiana. Uh, she was actually scheduled for a L2 to S1 fusion with decompression with a neurosurgeon out in Louisiana. She came to see me, she flew, we did a telemedicine uh, visit before and um, I was able to give her um, an injection and that injection six weeks later, still 90% effective. It took away her back pain as well as her leg pain. And whether this is a long-term solution for her or not, uh, probably not, but it's certainly, you know, she has never had injections before and she's very happy with her decision so far. It may buy her some more time before we have to actually get her to surgery. Uh, this is just some of the uh, patients I've seen recently. Uh, this is a 37 year old male from LinkedIn. He's an engineer, works for Pfizer. Um, he had an L5S1 ismic uh, spondy here. Uh, 27 year old male from YouTube, uh, neuroscience grad student. Uh, so these are not just uh, some uh, you know, possibly non-surgical patients. Um, you know, this patient has a very large uh, scoliosis, um, you know, almost 90 degrees. Uh, his ODI was 6%, VAS 10 out of 10. Uh, this is another 24-year-old male from YouTube, uh, L4-5, uh, you know, central uh, stenosis from a large disc herniation and also at L5-S1. Uh, so, you know, the, everyone is probably pretty excited about that, but uh, not so fast. Uh, social media is very powerful, but you, you have to understand kind of the viral nature of social media and whether this is uh, just people taking what you say out of context, you certainly have to be careful with that. This uh, physician here was actually, uh, he stepped down from his, from his position um, out in, in, in Dallas. And, uh, you know, this is probably something that was taken out of context, but you have to be very careful about that. Another physician who was let go for some comments that she made online. So you, you have to be very careful in terms of what you put out. But these are five reasons why I think everyone should use social media. Um, I think it's important that you know, you're going to build your brand no matter what. Uh, you need to find some type of niche that you can uh, kind of promote online or talk about online and just add this to the social conversation with medicine and also spine. You have to understand that your online presence is your business card. You know, uh, most people are going online to search for providers for their, their health conditions. And if your name pops up, well, that, that's, that's your business card. Uh, number two is to advance your passion. Uh, you can bring your interest to people who wouldn't um, otherwise read or di digest that information. You can use social media to tools or hashtags to bring this information to a wider audience. Uh, and also to teach patients and the general public, like Dr. Heisey, uh, who was talking about Peyton Manning's uh, spine surgery, or Dr. Jeffords' A-lift procedures, Dr. Blumenthal's uh, video. Well, this is a great way to kind of get your name out there and, and also educate your, the public in the meantime. And then this is just a website that we used to hand out in fellowship to uh, patients, but you have to be very careful with these as well because they are marketing other groups and practices and you just don't wanna lose that patient uh, to another group just by uh, them going online to uh, you know, learn information about their condition. 
um, and also to attract patients. So very few patients are likely going to trace their decision to seek out your practice, uh, particular to uh, one particular social media post, but you can form a overall impression that is um, from your social media kind of online presence that can certainly kind of tip that scale. The patient from Louisiana, who we've met probably four to five times, a couple of telemedicine visits, and when she flew out to see me, uh, well, at this point, she says that she does not want anyone else to touch her spine um, just because of that connection that we made uh, during those visits. And also to publicize your research. Uh, you, this is a great way to get your name out there in terms of all the, uh, the wonderful things that you're doing and publishing. Uh, this is a great way to do that. Uh, so a couple things that I want, want to kind of leave. Um, you should put out consistent and targeted content uh, specific to those targeted keywords that we talked about. Um, and whether this is hot trending topics or day in the life videos, um, you have to really target your content that you're put, putting out. Uh, patients should have the opportunity to book their appointment online at any time. You need to streamline this process so it makes it easier for them. Um, educational videos for patients to uh, view before, during, and after your clinic appointments. Um, a lot of the, the, the terminology and language that we use in spine surgery, you know, a lot of the patients really don't understand kind of what that actually means. So having some type of content where you can send to them is extremely important. And also to create and build a email list. Uh, you know, any of these social media platforms can be deleted. But if you have an email list, as let's say if Dr. Geyer had an email list of every single patient that he has seen over the last 20 years, 30 years in practice, well, he can send out an email to all of these patients and, and let them know that, hey, there's a, no, a new ADR uh, implant on the market. And uh, you, if you're having symptoms, please come in and see me again. Otherwise, a lot of these patients can be lost uh, over the years. But my final thoughts, I think word of mouth is still king. Um, time is the rate limiting step. Uh, this is gonna take time to build your practice. I'm, I'm starting to realize that. You have to build trust with your referring providers. Uh, you should not wait on your group or your practice to market yourself. You should get out, knock on doors, go door to door. Today, I spent a few hours just uh, going from door to door, just telling people, hey, I'm new in town. Um, I'll see your patients at, you know, the same day or the next day, here's my cell phone number, but you have to be available, affable, accessible, as well as accountable. And then, um, you know, social media, it, it can certainly supplement everything that we talked about, but word of mouth is still king. Um, and then you, you just have to just uh, kind of wait it out. And this is just, uh, this is probably overkill, but this is what I keep in my car at all times some handouts, some business cards, some referring pads. So once I'm passing by a particular location, um, I was just going to the gym a few weeks ago. I stopped by an urgent care center. I still have my scrubs on, of course. But uh, that same night, I got a call from the urgent care center. There was a patient that uh, had some weakness that needed an ACDF. So certainly get out, knock on doors, let people know that you're in practice. Uh, and uh, that, that kind of a good segue to uh, Peter's uh, talk. So that's awesome, Dr. Webb. Thanks for giving us that. Um, you obviously have a lot of experience and we already have several questions for you. So when we get to the Q&A, we'll uh, send all of those your way. Um, when, I, when I did my fellowship at, at Texas Back with uh, Dr.